Hello, uh, welcome to another Lived Quality Conversation on the Lived Quality Podcast. Uh, today, I'm privileged to host uh, Sam. Uh, I've met Sam on the net, which is another community com- place where we meet and have conversations. Uh, Sam is an architect, uh, or she works with architecture, <laughs> and she's a great mind. And we sort of like have a similar thinking when it comes to life. I'm going to invite Sam to introduce herself more and uh, share what she's been thinking about. And we'll take the conversation from there, as we always do. Yeah, Over thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Sam, Sam Woolman. Um, I, online, I write a blog called Marble. Um, and so it's, it's, that's my main jumping off point for like what I'm thinking about. Um, and as you said, I, I work in architecture um, as a designer and working on getting a stamp just in my professional life. Um, but uh, when I started my blog, I thought, yeah, I'm going to be blogging about architecture or design or like the philosophy of design, because those are sort of my, they're the things I studied and they're the things that I put a lot of effort into. But as the blog progressed, I realized like I was a lot more concerned with maybe just general issues that come along with writing, um, just introspection in general and, and and what reflection does to a life. Um, yeah. And so I've sort of pivoted away from talking about philosophy of design. I don't think I was ever really talking about that wholeheartedly. And I've just moved on to writing in general. Wow. Yeah, great. Uh, it's like I do a bit of writing as well uh, on the lived quality uh, blog, uh, where it all started for me to now take it into uh, a podcast. Because I used to sit there and write out my thoughts, and it was all nice. And I, w- I got dragged into the rabbit hole of writing. There's a lot of ways to write and, you know, polish it all up. Uh, but then at some point, you, it's like it's a processed conversation, <laughs> right? Like when you write it, then it's a processed conversation. Because when you're writing it, it's like another conversation you're having. And, mm-hmm. and then I was like, wait, it's way... It was easier if I imagined that I'm talking to someone as I wrote. And then I went from there and decided, well, how about I just speak to people, right? Mm-hmm. So so now the way I do it is I have a conversation and then I'll uh, review it, edit it. And in the process, I'm figuring out the theme of it. And then mm-hmm. I write about it. Then after I've written about it, then I know what it was about. So I'm doing it the other way around, which is much more enjoyable. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's good to you know to hear that you've been doing that as well. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I haven't yet had a chance to read through most of your book, but yeah, definitely bookmarked. <laughs> and I'm gonna dive in, and I'm already subscribed as well. Uh, so cool. So I'll add. The, we'll be adding the links in the in the post, and uh, people who want to check it out, they can check it out there. Um, yeah. So Sam, we had we had chatted about talking about you know how family uh, gets into all aspects of life. Uh, I don't know what some of your thoughts about that and, uh, you know, what I've been thinking of around that space. Yeah, so um, in my personal life recently, um, I've I've had uh, a big shift in my own family, um, which was uh, last year uh, my my grandmother died. Um, And, yeah, you know, like... Grand grandparents die. Um, she was the last of my grandparents to pass on, um, and it, I just um, it was really sad for me. Um, but it was really like weirdly like fruitful in in ways, and um, I just yeah, I kind of had this thinking like there's a certain wholeness um, to a family that. It, it's like a seed, like it gives you everything that you need. Um, and more specifically, you get to see like all the kind of mysteries of life, you know, like birth and death are all contained inside of a family. And yeah, so yeah, since my grandma passed on, it, it's something that I've been thinking more and more about, like just the wholeness of, of, of experiencing a family, you know, being a baby <laughs> and going through all like all the phases of and all the roles of 
of familyhood. Yeah, uh, I, I'm in complete resonance with that. Yeah, I feel like the 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 family life is where, like, we're meant to. It's almost like to practice the ritual of living. Uh, for me, at least, that's how I've been approaching it. Uh, I I do read a lot of uh, philosophical works, and I do, you know, follow a lot of people talking in this sense. Um, but usually, my filter point is how do I bring that back to my family? How do I how do I apply this when I'm negotiating with my four year old about bedtime? Right, <laughs> or trying yeah. to persuade them to have a meal, or help them work through uh, a tantrum that you know that they're they're struggling with. And so, for me, I find that it all has to come back and work in this context for me. Otherwise, then it's it's a bit too far removed. And so it's like sometimes when um, you know academic people will be speaking about all the, you know, the, the, the ancient philosophies and, 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 and where the original concept comes from. I'm going like, yeah, that's great. That's really beautiful. But please disseminate, bring it down to me so I can, I can find a way to make it fit the current every, day to day and, and see how to take that and reincorporate it. Because um, most of these concepts and most of these uh, philosophies I think were meant to solve like real problems all these people were struggling with something and it led them to an insight that then they felt the need to document and and you know share and so I completely agree like the 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 family is the point where life actually happens and and there's a lot of experience like you know life starts in there it's like you, even when you meet someone uh you you know, very quickly it will always go back to their family I was, I was chatting with a friend uh yesterday who has this strange relationship with their family um but every now and then it it all comes back to uh, their values uh, and their values are from their family and I was telling them look it doesn't like at the time when you get the values that your family gives you it's not like you have a choice <laughs> right these are your carers they they mean well and they're giving you the best that they they can best of the circumstances and what they know and what they know at the time and what they have learned and so unfortunately for you this is this is what shapes your perspective. And so it doesn't matter if later on you develop your own understanding and then you go like, well, I disagree with this value or this philosophy. It's great. But you shouldn't villainize them because at the time, <laughs> they were just solving for what's there. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I feel like we need to be respectful of that and be kind to you know, those that passed it on to us. I don't know, what what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, like, estrangement from families is sort of, like, a vogue topic at the moment. Um, Kind of as as psychology becomes more of, like, a pop phenomena, I think you hear a lot about that discourse. Um, But I really liked what you said. It's like they're giving you their values and... Um, and maybe it's not direct, like simply whoop, taking our values, putting them in you. Um, but I, I, I think there's there's something interesting in that. Like here I am, I'm a I'm a being who speaks English, and I have I write a blog, you know, like where I inside of my mind I I, I undergo this attentional process where I take this language and and I use it to try and think through the things that I know, like start from a point of known and and think it through and create distinctions and stuff. But um, it's like my mom, she's the one who went through the joint attentional process that like taught me the language with which I think. So it's like, without her, I got nothing, you know, like, (laughs) 
without, you know, without my mom, my dad and my grandma and like all of their literal attention, you know, like I wouldn't have been enculturated enough to like to to defy their values or to to disagree, like, you know, so it's like, yeah, at the root of things, like. I feel for me that that makes it's that kind of thinking process has always been like, oh, OK, yeah, family comes first, like that's how, how I want to be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. It, it does come first. And and it's kind of like irrespective of the because at the time you don't have like a moral filter yet. Like mm. it's just more like survival. It's like, look, I just need to eat and sleep <laughs> and I need help with those things. They're like real big problems for me right now. And and so, you know, you take what you what you what you're given. And I don't uh, and like you've shared this. It's not like they're. They're going and saying, look, forever, here's your value set and never shift it from that. It's more from a point of, look, this is what, this is a way to solve this problem that may, may be harmonious in our current situation. And so, yeah, try that. Why not try that, right? <laughs> uh, but in some cases, you know, later on, uh, we we get like trapped. I, I was uh, reading, um, uh, not really. I don't know if it's the same these days because we when you listen to a book, is it reading? <laughs> Some people will argue that it's not. Uh, I, I I would say it's still reading. Uh, yeah. Because like if you go if you go to like a book reading by an author and they sit down and read the book to you, uh, you get yep. to hear it first hand, right? So it's it's still a reading. So. <laughs> Anyways, I, I was listening to uh, Paradise Lost, uh, uh, what's his name, John Milton, and in there, I was struck by that part where, you know, and it's still it's still eating at me, right? Like, eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil sort of, like, kills you, mm-hmm. and, and then later on... Uh, you know, these characters are sort of like trying to understand what that death was. It's like, oh wait, uh, this the serpent ate, but they really did not die. At least they did not die the way we thought they were going to die, right? And so, what else could they? What, what did it mean to die? Oh, do we really die? And and for me, what stood out is like knowledge can sort of like lock you into a pattern. And I think when when you when you're growing up. And you're given all these no, all these pieces of knowledge. Um, it's your first piece of knowledge, right? So it's sacred almost to you. It's like the only thing you know. The Dunning Kruger effect, right? It's like therefore you know everything, right? Uh, but actually, it's more like a doorway to everything you can know. And I like to use the example of uh, how long it takes to learn how to brush your teeth. It's like even now, it seems like I'm still learning. It's like every day when I brush my, I'm, I'm kind of like questioning, am I doing it right? Am I, oh yeah, I need to do this. I need to do this step. And so when you're starting off like at, you know, one year old or something, uh, you're still struggling with how do you hold the toothbrush? You know, are you mm-hmm. holding it properly? Are you, you know, are you getting all, all the teeth? It's like, I don't think you're even thinking about that. You're just trying to get through that thing and then yeah. you have to do this on repeat and and for the poor parent they're going like when are you gonna start to do this <laughs> right I, I i didn't know when i was signing up for this that i had to give you like you know a thousand lessons of tooth brushing before you may even start to do it on your own right yeah and then and then but not just us i have to give you a thousand lessons to brush your teeth maybe two thousand five hundred on how to eat so it's like in thousands and yeah. yeah, it's massive. <laughs> it's a lot. Well, I think this is a really great like point because it kind of goes back to like the idea of of families um, being a whole. Like, mm. like because when when you have a child and they're they're going through all the all the phases of ontogeny, like um, there you know there's they're like recapitulating modes of experience of like 
coming from, you know, they literally were once single celled and then you've grown them to like these little babies and then they have to like go through all of these stages of apprehension to like get to fully grown. But we just think of people as like just adults, but no, everybody's gone through like this whole process. And a friend of mine, she, she has a, um, uh, a young uh, daughter she's, she's um, about four months old and she um, she recently started to fixate on tags did, did your children do this oh, well, like, she, like bag tags or like um, well like tags like little like tags on your shirt or like, uh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. On, her, on her stuffies or like if a toy a plastic toy has like a sticker tag on it she's like what's with this tag and so my friend had done some reading and she realized like, oh, like this is a stage of development where she starts to realize that there's a part of this object that doesn't quite belong to it. It's sort of like different, like in some, there's some order of it, which is different than the order of the toy. And yeah, so she's now just like loves tags, um, which is so cute. Um, but, you know, like that was, that would have... There would have been a point, you know, in mammalian development where knowing if something was, you know, integral to the whole of, of the object, like that object apprehension, it's just like, you know, like she's like speed running evolution right now. And it's like she gets a little frustrated and fussy and it's like, man, she's doing work. You know, she's growing. It's a lot. And it's just like, yeah, it's, it's like, wow, you get to observe that. Yeah, it's, it's it's such a privilege, right? It's such a privilege. Yeah, but but it takes uh, it takes a certain kind of I don't know. You you have to get to a certain place to see the privilege in it. Like for me, um, personally, like my first child, uh, when he was growing up, it, it was more of a frustration at the time because like this is all news. Like it's like I don't feel like I was a very good in the, the early stages because like <laughs> I wasn't there yet right it's like I was trying to figure things out that's frustrating you still have to do life and yeah. it's like you're, you're tired you, you're tired you still have to work and now you have this extra responsibility uh but then later and uh you know w when my second child came along um that was a different experience the, mm -hmm. First, you assume that every experience you got from the first one is mm. uh, definitely going to, it's just going to be copy paste, right? It's like, come on, done this before, so just repeat, right? Then you realize, no, it doesn't work. Like, uh, this is a whole different person. They, they respond very differently. So you have to learn from scratch. And then you go through that disappointment, <laughs> all your hard work. <laughs> does not get to be currently it doesn't compound you have to start from scratch again and yeah. but then you you know the quicker you walk out of that and, and get back on board the better um but but then the strangest thing like I, i'd seen this in movies like I, I don't remember the title of the movie but it's this specific scene like a lady is at the mall and she call there's a, a call to her She's at the mall buying some groceries and there's a call to her and s someone she left the child with is asking her what to do because the child is crying mm. frantically. And mm. so she goes like, put the child on the phone. It's like, and their baby is like, yeah, 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 put them on the phone. And they put the phone on and the baby's crying. And she goes like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a diaper change. Mm. Yeah. Cause like you could, cause like, yeah. It struck me. I was like, how how could she know? Is that like a real thing? Then I did some research on it. I found it was a real thing. I'm like, but how? Right? It's like, yeah. how do you interpret it? And then with time, like when I actually paid attention to this child and really started to observe them and pay attention, I started to get the nuance, the difference mm -hmm. between the cries, between the tired cry, between the I can't sleep cry, between the, I'm hungry. And I need a diaper change. And and when they're not crying, it's like all these are all this. It's, it's like they have very limited modes of communication at the time. It's like, well, I can either be sleeping or I could be 
giggling and smiling, or I could cry, right? So like, mm-hmm. uh, the, the the Groot character in uh, from the from the Marvel <laughs> universe. It's like, yeah, I am Groot makes sense now. It's like it's not about the words; it's about the intonation and the context mm-hmm. and and how they're saying it. And and when the raccoon is interpreting, it's like, yeah, I'm I'm with the raccoon. I'm like, yeah, I, I get it. I I totally get it. You have to like really pay more attention to see through what's there mm-hmm. to get to the meaning that's coming through. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it's like if you can if you can overcome the 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 entrapment of language or the limits of language, then you can communicate almost languagelessly if, if that's even a thing. It's like it's like you can you can exceed the limits of language and then sort of like just resonate with the other person yeah. and and what they're saying doesn't matter anymore it's yeah. more like it's like yeah, yeah I, I know you said a bunch of stuff but but i hear you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and it like takes the endurance that you build with a person in your you know just being around them day in day out that that i feel like you begin to read those idiosyncrasies you know, because the way that I intonate to um, display that I'm happy or display that I'm angry is going to be different than like somebody else because it, yeah, it's not a codified like thing the way that like words more so are. Um, yeah, and like I, I like the 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 difference. Like, there's different lang- there's different levels to language, and I, I think sometimes we think like we think in from the perspective of literacy but like literacy like isn't a given you know biologically like we don't need to be literate um you know humans were oral beings just for so long and um there's something like in orality you you always have a voluptuousness and a sound to language that like writing something on the page sort of cuts away from it and I, I think it you can kind of think of the two like levels of language between like consonants and vowels. Consonants are like the the armature, the, the hard armature on which you like like paint over the the the, the like emotive potential of vowels because the mm-hmm. vowels are very mm-hmm. breathy. You, you know, you breathe into them, and often extending vowels like gives those different um feelings but yeah like i i think if you if you were a person who had never experienced language without sound the way that we do when we read um yeah you wouldn't i i think like you wouldn't think of it as beyond language like that is language you know like language is sound like yeah but yeah yeah. it it, it is and and i think it's that that's where we sort of like get trapped in it um but it's more like a trying it's more like it we're trying and i think we spoke about this with daniel sometime but um like we're trying to compress an experience and Mm -hmm. transmit that experience because you know within our own perspective of our experience of this reality uh it's so hard to articulate it you know, to even uh, transmit it. And so you you have to, like, you have to do a lot of work to get, like, glimpses. And so package them using language. But but the way you intend it, it's more like a pointing towards. And and so that's why when you when you hear someone, if you, if you put some, uh, especially when you do, like, this reflective kind of, um, mirroring kind of speech right where you play back to a person what they said all of a sudden they can get an opportunity to edit what they were saying and so Mm -hmm. uh, so taking that modality allows Mm -hmm. for them to update it and and go like oh no 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 that's that's a bit inaccurate or that's not clear I can see that now as a consumer of this message so how could I make it better? And so then they refine it, and then they, they 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 try again, they try again. But that requires a slowing down. And mm. and when you, you know, like 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 the if if it's a foreign 
language that you're aspiring to, this can be a problem. Like, for example, where I come from, I, 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 I come from Uganda and, you know, now I live in Australia. But growing up in Uganda, it's like you are growing up and is this, you'd say, overvaluation of learning English, right? It's like yeah. there's a big, it's looked at as a really good thing that you, you're aspiring to right from when you're little, going to school, you're being encouraged to learn to speak English because uh, that that's the language that will unlock the doors, it will get you a job, it will help you through school. And, and that is correct. And that's valuable at that point. However, it comes at the, the cost of you not fully developing your understanding of your native tongue uh, because you're prioritizing to, to learn that. And later on, uh, we get stuck like in the definitions of the language, right? Like for a very long time, uh, it was it was like abominable, right? Like to make up a word that's not a mm. real word, like like in 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 our speech, like especially uh, back home, you if you say the word and and it was strange, instead of somebody trying to infer what you meant, they would challenge you to it's like. No, that's not a real word that you use. And so so then you're quickly drawn into mm. arguing about, is it a real word? Is it not a real word? What does it mean? What did you mean when you used it? And, and so it's an unnecessary conflict, which breaks the spirit of the conversation, right? Yeah. And so then you stop relating, and now you're stuck in the definition of the language. Um, but then later, I've come to learn that, well, actually, the words... <laughs> The words are just like a placeholder for experience that somebody's trying to to express, mm -hmm. and so the work is to figure out the expression, figure out what they're trying to mean, and maybe if you can reflect that meaning and just oh wait, I think you mean this, or maybe I'm getting that you're meaning this. Uh, this is the sense that I'm understanding. That is so helpful because then they, they don't have to justify what they're saying or try to to make it better. They can skip all of a sudden to refining their expression and, mm -hmm. and adding more context to that, which makes it richer and and maintains the connection of the relation. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. What, what, what do you think of that? Yeah. Well, it, it makes me think of um, metaphors because sometimes... Um, you know, metaphor is employed, especially when you're talking about things that are a little bit beyond your horizon of literal, um, literal comfort, right? Or literal understanding. Um, and sometimes, or often, yeah, like emotions, we tend to speak about emotions a lot with metaphor. And that's because well, what literally is a metaphor other than its outward expressions? You know, it's all happening on the inside. It's an experience. That is to say that sometimes you use metaphors and it like lands, you know, a person feels it, gets it. It's like the the meaning is conveyed like without thought. And other times you use a metaphor and you're like, oh, so that's like if you did this and then, oh, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. And so like, um, yeah, I just thought of that because you're saying like, oh, when you're making up words and stuff, like sometimes there just isn't some, like there is a horizon. Like, you know, sometimes there just isn't the right word to like quite say what she wanted to say. And so, yeah, you you got to make up a word. And if it lands, then it was a good invention. If it doesn't land, then maybe it's just confusing. Um, but yeah, uh, like I, the beauty, I think, of, of language is that it can do things like that. You don't have to pre-code it, you know, like if it were um, a perfectly, like, discrete uh, representative representational system. Like, I don't know if that's so accurate, but but you know what I mean? Like, it's not like I have to say, oh, I made up this new word. Here's its definition. I'm about to use it. Da -da -da. Like, no, like yeah. it either works or doesn't, right? Like. Yeah, in the moment, uh, the, the the recipient of this word will will sort of like convey to you whether it worked or not, and then you can quickly move on. And, and I think that is 
that that is where you sort of like have to surpass language you sort of like start to play with it and and i think even in writing when you get to that point where you can let's say leave behind the shackles of the definitions mm-hmm. then you're free to become creative it's like mm-hmm. now you can actually express uh what you intend to express and and then it's so like i think that's what they mean like finding your voice right? then you will have a voice then you can actually speak with authority then you can actually author because because now you 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 have the freedom and i think that is a very very important thing uh even with families because um you find that like these are young children especially where children are involved um you we have a lot of work to help to help them clarify what they are trying to point to and when you when you approach it this is oh my god the the conversations these little humans have are amazing and they're so intelligent beyond what you'd expect because they 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 have this strange sponge like you'd say way of consuming everything that's happening around them and for you if you're their parent they're always orienting their attention to you because they they're also aspiring to be like you so they take everything you do very seriously and that's mm-hmm. where you 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 get into uh like you know like domestic violence situations because you 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 see that and partly and, and and this is something like i picked up recently it's more like if you are a parent and you see your child repeat a mistake that you know you do mm-hmm. you do not like to see that at all you mm-hmm. feel like what mm-hmm. did i do i let them i i i i i misrepresented something that i did not want to let out right so i need to find a way to stop this and in some cases you know depending on the person some people are better than others at, at handling this uh so you can easily quickly you know turn into a violent situation not that it was intended to be it's more like something escaped me that i did not want to escape me and i need to try and take it back from you but at that point it's too late probably uh mm-hmm. but i think that is one of the things that leads to that however it's a big it's such a big responsibility right such a huge responsibility um yeah i don't know what are some of your thoughts on that yeah yeah i was thinking to just like this um well like at the beginning of what you said with like their sponge like nature i yeah it's it's kind of like crazy because they're working when they're learning language and they're going through those stages they're at such a deficit of information like yeah. it's is like in the same manner that I don't pre define the word I made up to to sh- share with you its precise meaning and then use it like nobody's defining words for children as they're teaching them the words like it, they're just absorbing the the sound and the phenomena of language in relation like totally in situ and um as, as a gestalt like in its whole like in a whole wave um and and you're not like breaking it down into like yeah definitions um but it, uh, yeah i think it's really interesting what you're saying about like like this aggression that can come maybe like through like ha- seeing a part of yourself like get outside of yourself and 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 family a- as a whole it's like this breaking down of, of personal barriers this experience of like breaking down of personal barriers you know like sort of physically just in in bearing a child you like have somebody inside you it's like where do i start where do they end like um and then you know like the child's born it's like you know very well if you just let this child sit there without any of your care it it, it would die or it wouldn't develop to its full potential you know like it's there's this interconnection, you know, like when you're in a loving relationship, you're, tr- you're trying to live your life together, you know, in an interconnected manner, right? Like as, mm. as partners. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like, you know, 
so so inevitably you know you're you're not gonna ever be able to stop parts of yourself like getting outside of yourself like it, it's just a really hard thing to accept when you want those boundaries really strong and and also in relation to very certain things you you want strong boundaries but you know i think family has a has a habit of, of breaking down those boundaries is kind of like that saying like oh, if you think you're enlightened go visit your family <laughs> yeah yeah i think the, the family does that but but i also think it, it's because like it's the it, I think families aspire to be the place where you are allowed to not regulate the, the, the versions of yourselves that are expressing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that would, like, if a family does that, like if people do that for each other, even, yeah. even in a relationship or any kind of relation, then it almost feels like, like a like a family in a way mm -hmm. because uh, you have the freedom to express endlessly without needing to do the work of managing the expressions mm -hmm. and so whenever you're freed from that work you feel mm -hmm. this freedom it's like oh I, so i can do whatever of course i still need to be appropriate but but like i'm not stopped you know, I'm, I'm I'm not stopped from being a certain way, and and you see this, um, like in in, in tribal societies, because like I grew up in in a, in a tribal society where it's defined what you're allowed to do and not to do, and you're told a lot of what you should not do, mm -hmm. and and in a way it's limiting, right? It's it, you, I don't know. I was describing it to a friend. It's like growing up we were told a lot of things that we shouldn't do, right? But we were not told what to do. We know everything we shouldn't do. It's like, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. But then you get to a place, you know, you, you leave the, the credit of your family and you go out there in the world and then nobody told you what to do and they're not there to tell you. And so now you kind of start to feel like, oh, wait, was I supposed to know this? Was I supposed how to to know how to figure this out? It's like nobody told me any of this. Like, so you feel like you you you're, you're put in a, a situation where you're challenged, and yet I I think like that's where you know allowing for you know holding that space to allow the the person like fully express then then you know you learn how to deal with your other selves, right? Instead of holding them back and sort of like just shaping them to a specific discipline and a specific vacuum and not, and surpass that limitation, right? Mm -hmm. And surpass that limitation. But I think if, if that's not, if that space is not held for you, then you later on you have to pay, you have to pay mm -hmm. for that because then you still have to learn afresh. And, Oh God, it can be so frustrating. I don't know. Um, yeah, what, what are some of your thoughts on that? Well, I guess so. I can I think I'm hearing like two different top. Like, there's two different things in there that I'm really like vibing with. And and yeah, it, I the first thing is just like this versions of self thing. And yeah, it's just like when I go home, it's just like you know, like I exhale. This like Montreal. I live in Montreal. <laughs> I exhale the city away and I inhale the smell of my foyer and it's very comforting and it, and it's sort of like taking off a coat and maybe that coat is like the 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 adult identity coat like in my mother's presence in her house I can be my little tantrum me like adolescent self sometimes I can you know like um wrap myself in blankets and watch movies and like, you know, just like hang out with her or we can um, fight about adult stuff and disagree about the news, you know? Um, but, but there's no like, m there's no tract of identity in which I must be in. It's just free ranging. Like 
I, I have the choice to do those various things with her. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 um, it's interesting because like, sorry, I'm, it's like, I, I feel some, sometimes I, f I very much feel like my mom, um, I don't feel understood by her in a discursive sense, but yeah. like that is actually like kind of the the and this relates back to um family estrangement and and when you feel like you should make distance between yourself and your fam some family mm. members but and there's definitely been times in my life in which I thought, oh maybe like I just cannot see eye to eye with these people whom I've known forever, like, this is a problem to me. But I think I've started, like, actually seeing that as an opportunity rather than a problem. Um, mm -hmm. Because, um, be because, like, over, those things change. Like, your thinking changes over time. And if... But but my, I mean, in my, in my case, I'm, I'm really blessed. Like, um, my case, like, even just the house hasn't changed, you know, my whole life. Like, um, and I can always return to that regardless of, of how that, how that changing aspect changes. Um, also, I, th I thought it was really interesting what you're talking about, about, like, growing up inside of a context where there's a lot of taboos. Um, and, like, it, it, it feels like the main... The main like guidance is an inhibitory guidance, and yeah. and like I think I don't I don't think like I think there's the advent of like there's the advent of like the helicopter parent, and I, I could see that as a as a type of, a style of parenting that like guides not in an inhibitory way but in um a prescriptive way mm. and and does the opposite of what you were describing like this is what you should be doing like these are the normative ways that ought to be lived do things like exactly like this um and i think like i probably i think i had more of an inhibitory upbringing where my mom was like don't lie um but um and like don't come home late at night you know like don't do that. But she never really like, un unlike a lot of parents in her, you know, even in her own friend group, she wasn't ever like telling me what I should be like, like, I guess I felt this way just with my career and stuff. Like she, she wasn't like, you have to go to university. She never, never told me that. She never really said like, I need to be working in a certain discipline or like, you know, I, th I think if, whatever I would have done as long as it wasn't like bad in, in one of those things that she would have disagreed with and been like, no, don't do that. It, anything would have been fine. And, and that was really like nice to me. Um, definitely let me come into, into my own apprehension of, of my own desires and my own wills in a way that like, I think like a more prescriptive upbringing wouldn't have. And like, yeah, and back to what you had said about about discovering a voice. I like I I think like that like identity coat that I take off when I come through the door and see her. It's that identity. I really it's a nice coat because she let me make it myself. You know? Mm, like I'm constantly mm. making that sewing that coat myself. She didn't say it has to be a tuxedo, you know? And yeah, I it I relish taking it off as much as I relish putting it back on, you know. Yeah, totally. And, and I think that's a for me. I feel like that's a hallmark of um. I think when we speak about uh, developed societies, I think that is one of the hallmark of that. It's like there's a lot of um allowance that is given for people to. Uh, express their essence yeah uh, mm -hmm. it's not constrained by let's say a tribal identity it's like oh you are a member of this tribe and we have defined what mm -hmm. that is 
and you have to map onto that blueprint or else we will shape you into it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And and so when you when when it's more like we're trying to shape you to a specific blueprint that we already made without understanding what, what you're showing up as, then you have all it's like on top of the suffering of the human condition, here's some extra some challenges yeah. <laughs> that we need to make it even much more intense. Um mm. yeah, and and I think that that just makes uh you know, it just sets up like later problems, like you know, un- unnecessary trauma. So like the inhibitions be- will express new problems or new versions. They will mutate into these new other expressions that later you have to live with lifelong. Um, as opposed to going to a more prescriptive, more more that guidance approach of like, hey, look, uh, so what is showing up? Well, you know, you like to do this. Great. Um, let's understand mm-hmm. that. <laughs> it's like you have a weird appetite. Great. Let's uh, let's note that down. Uh, like you know, children have the strangest appetites. My my daughter loves having uh, fried eggs with marshmallows for breakfast. Like I would not have that. Like it's, but it's have every. So it's one of our favorite dishes. And they're like, I can make it. Like, I'm not, I'm not having that. It's like, it's like, but, but go, cool, let's, let's explore this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if I was to do what I was taught, I would just go, no, you don't eat that. That is not a thing. Do not mm-hmm. even think about it. Here is what a breakfast meal is. And therefore, it's always that or nothing. Yeah. And, so, and and then we get to miss out on uh, eggs and marshmallows, right? <laughs> Which is not such a harmful thing, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's kind of like that, like, is that a real word thing? It's like, is that a real breakfast? Like, I mean, <laughs> if you eat it at breakfast time, like, yeah. If <laughs> you eat at breakfast time, it counts as a meal. Then it is a meal, right? But is it? We, we can we can review later what other consequences are there for it. But it shouldn't. Like I shouldn't. I don't think like it should be inhibited. Like it shouldn't be stopped before we understand what it is. Or maybe you know it, it's a box that comes and it's a it's a problem it comes with all these consequences, and then we'll go like. Maybe not. It's like when we make eggs with marshmallows, then the house lights on fire. We like this house. Let's let's not do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like there's like there's like we can take it back to like the reason why we try and inhibit that behavior. It's not because like it's it's not just because it's like everything about it is bad. It's but there is but there might be a very well good reason not to do it. Like there's lots of good reasons not to lie. And I mean, you get two ways to learn things sometimes. You get the hard way and the easy way. And sometimes you can just like listen to your parents and sometimes they can impress upon you the value of a certain thing enough that you don't have to go and break the rule and find out the hard way. Or you can find out the hard way. You can find out why not to lie by lying a lot and having it all fly back in your face, right? Like, Yeah. Yeah. And I think families should be a place where it is safe to test out all these uh, potentials, mm-hmm. like in a, in, a, in a controlled way. It's like, well, this is what happens in a small way. It's like, let's test this idea and see what happens. So you can actually know the the, the, the virtue it's trying to, to bring forth. Um, but when it goes to like you know relationships that are outside family, then you get a choice, right? Like you you have a choice, um, and and it reminds me of something like you shared uh, about on the net, like you you lost you had to end a friend relationship, and 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 that reminded me of my own. Like at some point, there there are friend relationships that you go like, oh, okay, I guess I guess that's the end of the road, right? And 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 some of them like the things that were coming to mind for me were like. Um, Look, some of these relationships have been set up at the time when you didn't have any sort of agency. It's like I've known 
this person since I was like age five. And that is the genesis of this of this relationship. And so I didn't know they were going to turn out the way they turned out. And I also didn't know I was going to turn out the way I turned out. And so at this point, at, at this stage in life, we we grew apart. And so we were completely different people. Mm-hmm. In some cases, you may find that, uh, yeah, like you you knew the person for a long time. And probably you met like in, in adulthood, but then you hadn't like really gotten to see them in a much broader sense, in a much deeper sense. Because, like, some relationships are, like, very high level in that, you know, you you meet with these people, you speak about the weather, politics, and whatever is trending, and then that's it. Like, you never really get to the personal. Um, But in some cases, you will get the privilege of, like, you know, having them live with you for a bit. And when you live with someone for a bit, like, you know, like the, the familiar space, then <laughs> then you, you, you start to see things that you'd normally not see, like in the, you know, 30 minute catch up, in the hour catch up, or even at work, like in a workplace context uh, where you're all being professional and working on these professional things. There's a lot of things you don't get to see. But if you are to live with someone for a bit, uh, like I had an opportunity to live, you know, I, I, a friend uh, relocated and they lived with me for some time. And after the, during that time, I got to learn so much more about them than I had ever learned about all the time I knew them in life. And hmm. by the end of that, and they got to learn a lot about me as well. By the end of it, by the time they had to leave, we went like... Yeah, I guess I guess this doesn't really work, right? So, <laughs> and yeah, there's, there's a lot we didn't know, but mm-hmm. and, and it sort of like all made sense retrospectively because mm-hmm. all the times we would get stuck in argumentation or some strange thing happens and you you question it and go like, oh, I really thought they were my friend. Then you kind of go like, oh, that is why. Like you get to this point and you realize. It all makes sense. I Mm. guess now is the time for a decision to be made, a choice to be made in this circumstance. Either I I change something fundamentally about myself to accommodate this, Mm -hmm. or I maintain who I am being and and lose that relationship. And so, yeah, I don't know. I'll I'll pass back to you. What do you think of those? Yeah, I think this is really an interesting like angle because on like onto family because it kind of talks about like the origin of families in a sense. It's like families are always like remaking themselves every generation. You you know usually you you have a partnership of, of whatever kind that that you know you start in, in one family and you. You, you separate from that family like through the course of your life and then you create a new family and um like love doesn't maybe love doesn't necessarily like i was kind of thinking so my on my walk back from yoga like love isn't family like a lot of the times you know maybe you maybe you hate your sibling like that's that's a potential family that's a potential family um yeah i was kind of thinking like love is not family it's like the thing which creates family you know like you have to have a certain amount of love before you're willing to make the kind of commitment that starting a family demands and i think what you're saying is really interesting in relation to that because it's like and and you and you brought it up earlier there's yeah there's some people in your life um who you can set aside all the kind of versions of yourself i think is how you said it and and they become more like family right um you, you know like there's not this need to like i don't know like uh play, play a role or something like you can be any of those roles um to, to them and and that's a sort of maybe that is a form of like family creation maybe more akin to like the kind of family you hold with like aunts and uncles cousins um but um yeah like it's sort of like as any maybe 
maybe re- maybe all relationships are tending towards a certain like degree of familiness mm-hmm. and sometimes like yeah like you said end of the road they kind of aren't going to they they aren't going to go through and 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 into a familial um mm-hmm. relationality and you just you know that um but one of the things with like long friendships like if you have a friend from say like when you're when you're a child is that like it's like you don't know how yet like you meet it's completely circumstantial you don't have any choice you know like they like barbies and you like barbies that's a lot in common at that point um but you know like and and you said like you don't know how they're gonna turn out but it's like you are the thing that is making them turn out right and they Mm -hmm. are the thing that's making you turn out into something right like you're you're intertwined um and yeah if if there are you know quote unquote irreconcilable differences which is what you you know how you nullify like marriages um you'll know (laughs) and and it but it's like it's not really nullifying it's just like it's like it's a different yeah in our last conversation that we had together with Annette, I just wanted to bring up like what Thomas said. It's like, it's not a void of a contract. It's like, if they died tomorrow, you'd probably still go to their funeral. Like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's not really like you're dissolving the relationship, but it's, it's, you you know, you're not going to bring them any closer. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think it's, it's, it's also part of an understanding, like a, a respect for, you know, sort of like allowing them to be uh, yeah. without having to constrain and shape it. Because most of the times, like, conflicts are more like a, like an attempt to reshape, right? It's, yeah. it, 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 it's more like, you're coming in shape this way, and I feel like I have the power to control that shape, so I'm going to ask you to reshape yourself. And mm-hmm. and it, it's always whoever feels as the ability to reshape that, you know, fights the hardest to emphasize the reshaping, if you may put it that way. Uh, and then, of course, it gets combative. It gets, you know, you're not listening to me. You're not, you're not appreciating what this is. Or you're not understanding. And all of that is leading to a certain truth. But, but also, I feel like there is, it all boils down to that point of, um, Accepting the difference, well, like oh, it's a different shape. Mm-hmm. I wish, I wish it wasn't. I wish it was more shaped this way. But it turns out that it it isn't. And if for the shape to be changed, a lot of work has to be done to where it needs to fit and to the shape itself. So should that work be done? Are the parties yeah. involved? interested in doing the work um or is this something that has to be worked with or lived with uh, I, 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 and so i think in families um there's a lot of uh living with especially like you know if you if you if you have like a very healthy family there's all the ways you are known it's like ah oh, yeah, yeah we know that about you and this is how we accommodate uh this is Sometimes you get shaped this way, and this is what we do when you do that. And sometimes you reshape yourself in this way, and this is how we still accommodate you, no matter what shape you turn up in. Um, but but going back to where it's very, uh, you'd say, taboo-like, you're not allowed to reshape yourself. <laughs> so like, no, 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 you went out of shape. Please go figure out your shaping and come back in the right shape otherwise you're not allowed here if you're not the right shape (laughs) yeah 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 and and really to follow this metaphor it's kind of like what works well you know if you take a piece of wood and you want to reshape it and you just 
immediately change it to that shape. Like there's a time dimension where you do that really quickly and you just snap the branch. But if, if you do that slowly, like it will change, you know, because like, I mean, to bring that more down to the actual like target domain of relationships and not talking about like sticks, but you know, like if I, you know, if I, if for whatever reason, whether I think it's, I just would like this person to be this way, or I, I live in, inside of like a culture where it's like, they should be this way. If I see somebody shaped in a way that I don't like, I, I can either fight them to go into, you know, whatever form I'd like, but like allowance is a form of forming, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's a method it's like the steam method you're steaming the wood and bending it you know you're just letting it droop into that sh into that shape um mm. rather than like you know pushing it it tenses and then it it becomes brittle and snaps like um and i yeah i i mean that's allowance is something that's yeah i've been kind of important for me and, and I think that, like in relation to oneself we can do probably well maybe not always but we can be very unallowing to ourselves and mm. we can in you know our own relationship to ourself can be a forcing that creates brittleness that breaks ourselves and yeah. I mean what is more tragic be you know like yeah yeah we 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 do that to ourselves a lot and and we forget it's like when we are and i've noticed this like when we when when we express that as um as something we we don't allow like mm -hmm. something we have to fight mm -hmm. in most cases it's so it's because it's already a battle we're fighting we, we yeah. it's a uh, yeah you know i i i wrote a series um of articles that I, I titled the village of the me's <laughs> and sort of like trying to think all that through and it seems as though like there is those selves that you kind of like kind of like if, if, if you're parenting a child that you see them reflect back and you go like not that uh, but there are also some inward that you already know about that you're always you know battling with trying to hold back trying to, to lock down and so <clears throat> it's not <clears throat> it's not just a battle within. I think it's also you're always looking out. It's like you're fighting this battle inwards, but also if you see any of those things walking around, you're gonna chase them down <laughs> and beat them down. And yeah. so every time you're, you're interacting with other people, <laughs> and then it's you you sort of like seem to see that, or you you think you're seeing that. Mm -hmm. You quickly step out and you go like. No, not that. Not that. I have to. I'm the champion who comes and fights this. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have a lot of that. Yet, like you just said, like allowance sort of like, you know, gives us the opportunity to understand, gives us to see the, the origin, the root of this, the, the actual nature of it. It mm -hmm. may not be something that or, or maybe like even if you observe it and you discover like yeah definitely this is something to address but you're not gonna address it through the symptoms you need to get to the root of it where what is it where does it come from what is it really about but i feel like we get trapped in kind of like the language thing we're talking about it's like <laughs> something shows up and you get trapped in fighting how it's showing up mm -hmm. rather than trying to understand what it is and I think we do a lot of that, and it's not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> it breaks us. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like a funny dynamic, hey, because it's like instead of allowing it in myself, I deny it in myself. I project it outwards towards somebody else. I chase it down. I don't allow it in them. I deny it again, <laughs> a second denial, and then I, and then I, I break. I try to break it outwardly and I break it inwardly, you know, like it's like 
Mm. It's just a little like it's just this like crazy House of Mirrors game, right? But but sometimes and and you know maybe this is where that that relief that you talked about in family is like the the biggest grace is that occasionally people who really love you are going to forgive you before you will and they're going to say you know like as i'm denying it in myself they're saying they're allowing it to be there in myself like oh hey like i don't know you lied um and i'm like no i didn't lie and they're like it's fine i don't care like you know like like there's like just a an allowance from somebody else can, can sometimes just like break the chain of denial, like non-allowance, non-allowance, non-allowance. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. It, and it can turn back inward. And um, yeah, I think there's just a, a lot of grace there, a lot of power there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and it gives you a way to relate to it because mm-hmm. by giving you the example of, Hey, uh, this is how it's, it's not the end of the world. If yeah. This happens, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's not the end of the world. We can actually live with it. Uh, I guess it's more here's a strategy of how you can deal with it because it could lead to like real trouble, um, okay. but it's not a catastrophe. And yeah. if it's seen you, it doesn't mean you're evil, yeah. <laughs> right? It's like it's like we we can we still love you. We can mm-hmm. still take care of you, even if you still have that thing and and it's fine it's fine so don't kill yourself over it um just figure out how to allow you know <laughs> how to hold the space for it and, and 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 i guess that that gives you a more healthy relationship with it and and i guess that's where all this uh what is it called shadow work yeah. is sort of like trying to drive towards um uh but yeah like f- family is a place where Actually, you, you, the family does a lot of that shadow work. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in a good family, in a good, healthy family. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, even sometimes though, like, unhel- like anti-heroes can be helpful, as helpful as heroes. You know, like, uh, um, maybe it's not so much about like having an in a prescriptive guide or an inhibitory guide. Or, you know, like constraining in those two different modes. But like, sometimes, you know, you look at, you might have a hero and you're like, I just want to be just like them. And other times you have an anti-hero and you say, oh, I would never be anything like them. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The Like, uh, there's this, I think there is, you know, like, um, I don't have children. I'm not married. But um but you know, watching friends of mine go from go through go through marriage, um, d- question whether to have kids, having kids, um, you know, the, there's these conversations and 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 reflections on this. You know, you're on the other side of the table when you have kids. You were once a child, and now you get to be the parent. And in that walking over to the other side of the table. Yeah, you can, sometimes it's good to have some anti-heroes, you know, like, I, this, this is how I was brought up, and I'll never treat my kid like that, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and you can do that, you know, even though that's, like, a denial, maybe there's, like, a marriage of denial and allowance where, like, I'm never gonna do that, but it's okay that it happened to me, like, there's something, there was an opportunity, like, like, you know, just like the things we condemn and we and we think are no good, like at least when you encounter <clears throat> things we would condemn completely, things which are simply not okay, they at least invite us to know to know their f- futility, right? Like, yeah. like you can learn the hard way. You you can tell a bunch of lies, and you can realize that lying isn't a good thing, right? Like. And at least the value of lying is that you'll learn, you, like, you'll learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it is. And, and it, it sort of, like, brings the, you to the, you know, I think we spoke about this in the net, like, the, the failure, you know, the, you get to the end of, of that appetite. 
and you mm-hmm. see what it produces because during the time when you have the appetite mm-hmm. it, you still haven't gotten to see all the consequences right yeah. it's like it's it's a whole experience like an appetite is an experience and uh, this happens all the time and and until you get to the other side of of the consequences of how that reshaped your life uh only then will you know what to do like as you get older you especially with like with your eating habits you have to adjust them you quickly realize oh i can't just even if I'm, i have the you'd say the affordability to have ice cream for all my meals maybe that's not something i should do because then it has all these no side effects right in in all these deep ways uh but if i was five and i have to decide it's like yeah i want to have ice cream for all my meals yeah it's like maybe for one day right like maybe for one day but for a week <laughs> for two weeks for a month uh you quickly start to run into the problems but you'd have to test it out um mm-hmm. And and I think we do. And then all of a sudden you go like, oh, I've been, life starts to feel uncomfortable in all these ways that now you know what you need to do. And some cases you, you it's even a privilege to get to know what to adjust, right? Because sometimes you don't get to see it and you it, it just becomes that shape that you have to always live with, right? Yeah. But like, Yeah, I mean, I think the difference between running that kind of experiment in your in all, in an adult life, like, hey, what are the consequences here? And in a child's life is really that like <clears throat> like um that acceleration of not acceleration, like um like like children as they're develop they're developing at a really rapid rate, right? Like they go from you know being a single cell to learning to read in like eight years well what have i been doing in the last eight years like not that much <laughs> um so like yeah you don't want to run that kind of experiment with your child being like what if you ate mcdonald's every day this week it's like no like the, we can't <laughs> they're developing like <laughs> that has outsized impacts like sure like i could tomorrow just eat mcdonald's every day for the week and you know like <laughs> it'd be a different story <laughs> wouldn't be good for me but like i'm not developing right like <laughs> yeah. and i think that's where the the emphasis it, it brings that side out is like it's like oh no 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 i have seen that and oh my god when you're developing this is not good for you you shouldn't do it yeah and yeah but then doing it in a in a way that is i don't know like more harmonious that doesn't crush the child i think that that is the challenge yeah <laughs> and and really like when it you know um this isn't e- this is a pretty pedestrian example because like i'm sure like you know at some point in my childhood my mom was like oh let's go on vacation and like i ate probably pretty crappily for a week and i was fine you know but just as a as a metaphor <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah oh well uh i think we've been talking for a while and uh it's been really really lovely we've we've gone places with this i have lots of thoughts buzzing that i want to write about yeah uh, i don't know if you if you if you want if you have some uh final thoughts and then we can bring this to a wrap up yeah i just final thoughts um sometimes you don't have to go too far to for the opportunity to like see the wholeness of the world right like sometimes it's everything like no matter where you go the earth is beneath your feet right like and mm-hmm. sometimes yeah your family you can gain all the wisdom of the world but but just by enga- engaging in like in a certain pure attention with your family and that's 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 kind of that's that's like infinite bounty and it's it's a great it's great just it's helpful <laughs> <laughs> well thanks um it's been lovely talking to you and we will talk more about some other things in the future okay Thank excellent you. thank you so much cheers